Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts of Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. You'll also find our archives where you can listen to every episode we've ever done going back to 2006. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. Today is October 22nd, 2013, and my guest is Nobel laureate Edmund Phelps of Columbia University. His latest book and the subject of today's episode of Econ Talk is Mass Flourishing, How Grassroots Innovation Created Jobs, Challenge, and Change. Ned, welcome back to Econ Talk. Thank, thanks a lot, Russ. Let's start with what you mean by flourishing. Uh, good question. Uh, to be, uh, roughly speaking, I, I, I mean prosperity, but of course, uh, prosperity is a word that we throw around without any uh, uh, a very uh, precise definition. Uh, uh, I, I do mean prosperity, but but in, in particular, I, there's a, there's a part of it that I think is the, is is a key key concept. Uh, you might call it prospering. You, you, we, we we wouldn't say that somebody is prospering just because he has a high wage. Now, we, we might say that somebody with a rising wage is prospering, but uh, I'm particularly interested in, in uh, the, the case where the rising wage is a result of, of, of the individual's efforts, um, his, his investment in himself, his, 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 the experience he's gained, the insights he's gained, um, that kind of thing. I'm not interested in, 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 in the wage gains that come from the glo- from um, what's going on in the global economy, w- which is causing the guy's wage to rise through no eff- through no effort or uh, through no effort on his own. You follow me? Yes, but you're also mean, you also mean something much richer in the book than just yeah. material well-being. Oh, a- absolutely. So that's the material side. Now, um, on the non-material side, I, I, I mean uh, the um, having fun. Uh, not every day, but uh, you know, lots of times. Uh, in, in the process uh, of uh, of uh, doing the work, in the process of uh, exploring and experimenting and uh, discovering and 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 uh, all that, so there's this there's the 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 uh, material prospering that uh, is 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 all about the um, the the uh, the money. It comes from from, from uh, experimenting and exploring and so forth, and and then there's the this the internal satisfactions that that come that come from it all. That's the non-material side. So this is a new phenomenon in in human history, uh, going back maybe 200 years for some people, but as a mass phenomenon or at least a common phenomenon. It's it's maybe only in the last century at best, and you and I, I think, are flourishing. We have rich lives way beyond the material. We are yeah. comfortable materially, but that's not what makes our lives so pleasant, I don't think. It's part right. of it, but it's not the main yeah. reason. Right. The, fact, the fact that I get to sit at this microphone in the comfort of my house uh, outside of Washington, D.C., call you in New York, have a, have a fascinating conversation and share it with people who enjoy it, most of them. Uh, yeah. That's just – that's extraordinary. So my yeah, my it, question is – and, and it, it clearly gives the texture of life a very different feeling than if you or I were in a factory all day long turning a, a bolt uh, a right, la right, Charlie Chaplin's right. Modern Charlie Times, Chaplin. yeah, which, right. you, which you allude to in, in the book. So yeah. my question is, is it – what portion of the American workforce has such a life? This life of challenge and change and interesting new things that come along, 
at one extreme versus the bolt at the other, turning the bolt at the other extreme. Yeah. Do you have any feel for that? Uh, well, sure. I, ha- I have an impression uh, about it. Um, what I what I argue in the book is that the, at the is that the first modern economies, Britain and America, around 1820s, were just full of people tinkering and, and uh, experimenting and and uh, exploring and and and, and uh, sometimes discovering uh, new ways to produce or or an improved product to produce. Um, I don't know much about John Deere, who invented important plow, but uh, you know, I'm sure he was a a, a guy who was uh, fooling around with uh, different ways of designing the plow, and he just uh, and through uh, experience and testing and so forth, um, he uh, hit upon a superior design. That was the plow that broke the plains that uh, created American agriculture. So. Um, I, I think it was. I, I think. I think that that uh, flourishing was uh, uh, widespread in America. It was. It was certainly. Pre- I'm sure it was present in agriculture and and in small manufacturing, and I think also uh, in in companies it was. Um, it was a uh, present top to bottom, right down to the grassroots. I I, I think. Now maybe that's hard. Hard. Maybe that's more difficult. Maybe that that's uh, more rare now, with all this high tech stuff. Uh, <laughs> well, it's hard to know. I but, think I think people who work on a, a Chinese assembly line producing iPods probably have a relatively unexciting life, but yes, their standard of living right. is being transformed, and that's wonderful. I'm yeah. just thinking about you know the average yeah. American. Um, yeah, it's hard to know. Yeah, so uh, I, I, my, my feeling is that um, while we there's still mass flourishing out there, me, meaning a whole bunch of people are flourishing, just like mass unemployment means a whole bunch of people are unemployed. Uh, it doesn't mean they're all unemployed. Uh, so, so I, I think we certainly do have certainly do have this mass flourishing out there, but. Uh, but I think it's not as widespread, not as mass, so to speak, as it was. Yeah, you and feel I, we've, and, and, we've and, lost and, something. And now maybe part of that is because it's maybe maybe some some part of it is because it's gotten so technical that that the people at, at the bottom of the organization chart can't uh, can't contribute. But I think that um, it's it's because mainly because of a narrowing of innovation. Uh, I, I, I think that there are whole industries now that 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 aren't are not nearly as innovative as as they were, and and um, I think that that most of the the innovating innovating that we see is is that brilliant stuff going out going on out in Silicon Valley and really up and down the West Coast, uh, a fairly thin sliver of of uh, land along the West Coast. And, and uh, they're kind of carrying us, and uh, but there's not much in, innovating going on in the heartland. I don't know what you think. Yeah, I don't know if that's true. I, I do think there's a lot of innovation going on on the West Coast. It's when, when I'm out there, and I I usually spend a chunk of the summer out there, and I find it it's invigorating. It's in the air. You can you can literally feel it. It, it seems anyway. Yeah, but, right. But I think about when I think about. Your concept of flourishing, I think about the person sitting in, in Wichita, Kansas or Peoria, Illinois or St. Louis, Missouri or Columbus, Ohio, who's doing something uh, innovative and exciting using modern technology. It might be improving sure, sure, a process. Sure, it sure, might be creating sure. a web page for uh, the, the company they work in. Uh, it might. Right. It's a thousand things. It's not the glamorous stuff that, that we I, I agree about. completely. We've got to stop thinking about innovation as being just uh, headline innovations, or uh, worse yet, uh, just uh, or just breakthroughs that come along every uh, decade or two, we've got to start thinking of innovation as something that goes on continually. Uh, it's got to go on. Surely, surely, 
a little bit of it must go on in operating rooms and hospitals. It must be that people notice different ways, better ways of doing something. Uh, and, and some of the more important uh, discoveries uh, immediately get uh, get taken up by other hospitals. And um, there's, a, there's a whole world of, of uh, change going on that we don't we don't directly see. Yeah, it's a very Hayekian process, as you mentioned in the book. It's the particular knowledge of time and place, the the insights yeah. that only the people who are touching and, and deeply involved in a process can often can generate. Right. Yes. So this transformation of material standard living and productivity in the 19th and 20th centuries, you attribute that uh, – you you – dispute the standard explanations of that transformation, scientific discovery, the headline inventions of of some of the major things that we think about at those times, and you want to really push this grassroots innovation. Explain why you reject the standard explanations and why you prefer the more – your approach. Well, <clears throat> um, there, there really wasn't much scientific discovery going on. Uh, in the 19th century, there weren't very many scientists in the world, for one thing. They, the, you, 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 I mean, you, I don't see how we could possibly ad- attribute uh, 2% uh, growth of productivity year after year uh, in Britain and, and America um, after centuries of 0.0 something. Uh, how could we could possibly attribute that to uh, a, a flow of scientific discoveries between uh, 18, 1815 and uh, and um, 1940 or 1960? But especially in in the 19th century, it just seems uh, as clear as day that that uh, businesses. People in companies are creating new products and creating new ways of producing existing products or improving existing products. And, and, and they're doing it um, uh, without uh, having to reach for some uh, uh, scientific textbook. As a matter of fact, uh, the economic historian Joel Mokher uh, w- w- says somewhere uh, that uh, scientists were um, challenged by what businesses were doing, and they had to uh, uh, pull up their socks and try to understand how it worked, how how, how those cha- how some of those uh, methods uh, worked, because they the, there had not been a scientific understanding uh, that that automatically led to that. What about the inventions you you mentioned? Uh, spinning frame, the steam engine, wrought iron, the locomotive. Uh, these were important, but you don't think they were decisive. I just think that those are the, the more conspicuous ones, the more the more, more obvious ones, maybe the ones that uh, it's easiest to tell stories about, the most colorful. Uh, Robert Fogel became uh, famous or, or notorious uh, for arguing that uh, the railroads uh, didn't contribute anything to GDP that wouldn't have been contributed uh, by uh, growth of the canals and and so forth. I'm not a technologist, but I, I would think that most industries could have got along in, in the 19th century could have got could have gotten along pretty well without steam. Uh, and of course, we're, we shouldn't be forgetting the, the so-called creative industries, a term I don't like very much since, um, after all, there's creativity going on in all industries, one hopes. Uh, one hopes that some creativity is being exercised in all industries, um, in the entertainment business. Do, do they need steam in order to uh, increase uh, box office receipts with with, with with their new developments, uh, no, I mean uh, the, their advances uh, were not uh, based on steam. 
um, clothes. Uh, for example, um, uh, cotton was uh, took the place of uh, wool. It was quite important. Um, disease rates fell as a result of that. And um, again, what's that? What's that have to do with steam and the steam age? So many people argue that that transformation of the 19th century uh, was a very unpleasant one for the workers who lived through it. You dispute that a little bit. You talk about the literature of the day, uh, Les Miserables and uh, Dickens, Oliver Twist and other yeah. other books of Dickens, that they yeah. paint a pretty negative picture of daily life. But you think it's, it was a little cheerier than that? Uh, well, first of all, I, I don't think that Dickens was um, a particularly a particularly dark writer. If anything, I would say that Mark Twain is a, a pretty dark writer. Um, uh, Dickens loved the energy of London. He used to take uh, what were called midnight walks, night walks, uh, through the city. He, like, he was a restless person, sometimes couldn't sleep, and. Uh, uh, he he he, uh, he loved the energy of the city, and 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 he, and he saw he saw businesses as uh, the salvation of people, giving them things to work on, give giving them activities to get involved in. Um, it, it's it's absolutely. It, uh, he was Dickens was excited by the times in which he was he was living. He did think that bosses should be more kind. And, and and think a little more about the way the way they're behaving. Uh, I mean, yeah, sure. I mean that that that's true. But um, you, you you can't say that uh, Dickens was a um, sort of a documentarian of uh, misery in the 19th century. That's just that's just not on. That's not that's not not correct. Yeah, it was probably hard to be an orphan in the 19th century, but that's that might be true in lots of times. Uh, but so, uh, yeah, maybe Oliver right. Twist is and, 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 uh, here. I, let me make this point, which certainly made in the book, but it, it can't be made strong enough. Uh, my my my, uh, my for me, what what symbolizes the mercantile capitalism of the uh, 18th, 17th, and uh, 16th centuries is the lone shepherd uh, cut off from society bored to death because nothing is happening and and he has nobody to talk to no way of having interchange with people he can't inter he can't exchange thoughts ideas that is really terrible and and by contrast uh Cities offered people fabulous opportunities for for interchange, for for developing their minds. Um, I think uh, Britain went from one city to five cities uh, in short order, and uh, on, on probably what is another definition, Germany went from one city in the 19th century to a hundred cities, according to one estimate, uh, at the end of the century. So, so the intellectual life and, uh, and, and, uh, sort of the, the stimulus of what's going on was so much richer in the 19th century than it had ever been before. Now, you know, that's just tough to prove. Uh, in, in a way that uh, might uh, satisfy an econometrician. But um, I argue in, in, in a chapter in the book that y you can kind of feel some of this in, in the music of the time. Yeah, I, 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 uh, I, I suggest that, Beethoven, that the last movement of Beethoven's Second Symphony is about trial and error. He marches in one avenue, then he beats a retreat, then he tries another avenue, beats a retreat. Uh, it, it's um, 
I was saying this at a, at a um, at a um, a little conference in in London, and some guy was shaking shaking his head up and down in agreement with me. He happened to know the symphony, so th- there was a lot of there's a lot of innovativeness. So work had suddenly become interesting for the first time for significant numbers of people. Yeah, I'm sure that guy nodding was an, was not an econometrician, or probably not. But <laughs> I, I, I take your point, and I think I think it's a it's a fabulous um, example: the, the lone shepherd versus the the person uh, living in the city. And I, I think if you want some evidence, that what I would look to is what's going on in China today. People don't want to be that lone shepherd anymore. They want to be in the city. They want to be doing that. That job that we look on, many of us in America look on as, as a dreary job working on that assembly line. Yeah. But it beats uh, – right. but at night but at night you have people to talk to and, and it beats staring off into the distance for 18 hours yeah. looking yeah. for lost sheep. We romanticize the lone shepherd. It's interesting. We think right. of him as as this right. uh, heroic and, and <clears throat> figure in touch with the land and in touch with his sheep. But in yeah. fact, uh, right. most of us don't want to go there. No, no, absolutely not. By the way, uh, you might be interested to to know whether there was something in my personal life that led me to that. And uh, indirectly, there is. My mother grew up on a farm, successful farm in southern Illinois. And she would shudder at the thought of going back to that farm. <laughs> she went, she beat a path to Chicago as soon as she got out of college and uh, and then never looked back. Um, you know, I spent a summer while, a, while, while her, while her seven brothers and sisters, uh, some of them, some of them did, uh, did, did stay on the farm. I spent a summer on a kibbutz in Israel picking peaches and, uh, let me tell you, it's, it's not exciting work. I did. <laughs> now, there are they're probably people who get satisfaction from, it. I don't want to suggest that all yeah, sure. rural right. activity is dreary. Right. But the craftsmanship of picking one without. Without damaging it or something there like that. There you go. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah. for me, it was the challenge of knowing when the tree was done. Uh, you weren't supposed to pick them all. Uh, there, there was some uh, mental agility there, but and, and judgment, but it was limited. Uh, yeah. Let, let's move on. You're very um, an important theme of the book is the dynamism of the modern economy. Yeah. As in, tell us what what that is and explain why Japan from 1950 to 1990, which was seemingly a very vibrant economy, it does not pass the test for you of a dynamic economy? Um, I, I don't really don't, I, I don't really remember saying very much about Japan. Um, I, I pretty much focused on Britain and, and America and later um, Germany and, and uh, France uh, Germany was so important it could hardly be uh, left out. Um, I, don't, I don't know what would be gained with, by by throwing in uh, Japan. Well, uh, I think but, I but, think your point was that much of their growth was adaptation rather than innovation. Yeah, yeah but, uh, I, I, I think I think that's right. And I uh, the thing is, of course, you know, in the social sciences, nothing, no statement is ever exactly right. I think or exactly descriptive. I, you know, there, there were some <laughs> some innovative uh, co- companies in Japan. I suppose uh, Toyota, Toshiba, Sony. Sony. Yeah. But but you know, these are a tiny. It's it's like the sliver of land in California. The, these 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 three companies were a tiny part of the GDP. So so uh, uh, the rest of the economy, I think, was just uh, copying. Uh, from America and elsewhere. So what? Just do you, like what, most of the European economies, um, n- Germany uh, aside, uh, did a whole lot of copying. Uh, e- well, well, later we'll get we'll get we'll get to the post-war period, I guess. But um, yeah, what's wrong with copying? It seems first of all, it seems like a good oh, thing. Sure, no, oh. Nothing so, is wrong with copying. A right. uh, uh, smart thing to do, right? Yeah. <laughs> but but Zvi Grilikas uh, said once. I think I quote it in the book. I'm not sure. Uh, he said he said the Europeans are so smart. They let the Americans uh, do the innovating, with with all the failures and successes, 
and uh, and the huge uh, outlay uh, for it, and the huge investment that has to be made, and and then the Europeans just pick up pick up the ones that uh, succeeded, pick up pick up the, uh, the 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 new products that got adopted, that were that were uh, economical to, de- to to produce and, and actually got adopted. <clears throat> but the trouble with with that is that it's not nearly as much fun to adapt something as it is to create it from scratch uh for, from from your own imagination from your 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 own perceptions and own intuitions about what would go and what wouldn't go so so uh, now now okay now i, I for me, a huge theme in the book is that job satisfaction differ, differs a whole lot across countries. Even in the 18 or so most advanced uh, economies uh, in the OECD countries. And I think that these, that the, I, I, I endeavor to show uh, that uh, differences in uh, job satisfaction are uh, the result of differences in dynamism. But <clears throat> since um, it's um, a little hard to measure dynamism, <clears throat> even even measuring innovation seems to be controversial, which surprises me. Um, uh, I and my uh, co-workers uh, did the easy thing and instead of making the uh, the explanatory variable something like the rate of innovation, uh, uh, we, we we looked at we uh, we um, we measured uh, modern values. We we measured uh, the extent to which people are seeking. Uh, an interesting job, the extent to which, when when they're asked, when you're looking for a job, do you look, the the the, uh, the World Values Survey, as far as surveys out at the University of Michigan, um, has a whole bunch of questions uh, like, when you look for a job, are you looking for a job that's interesting? Well, <clears throat> and Americans and and Canadians, uh, a very high proportion of them answer yes. Uh, on the continent, um, not so much. And, and um, do you look for a job where you can, where you will have opportunities to exercise initiative? Again, uh, in America, Canada, a uh, whole bunch of yeses. And and so uh, we constructed a sort of index of this uh, modern mentality which I think goes back to Britain and America in the 1820s, as we were talking about. And, and, and differences in, in those responses across countries uh, does a pretty decent job of explaining differences in job satisfaction levels. Well, I, I look forward to some emails from our European listeners who want to dispute those, <laughs> those ideas and claims <laughs> um, about the relative uh, lack of, of – dynamism in, in the European economy, but maybe some will agree. Uh, when we think of when we think of innovation, we think of entrepreneurship and disruption, which is one of another theme of your book, uh, we often think of Schumpeter, but you're not such a big fan of his. Uh, in fact, you suggest that he his early work put us on the wrong path. What did he what did he get wrong? <clears throat> well uh, it, it, it's hard to talk about Schumpeter without talking about the German historical school. Uh, Schumpeter uh, came from uh, the southern tip of Austria. He was an Austrian, got educated in Vienna. Uh, but before Schumpeter, uh, there was the German historical school with people like uh, Arthur Spiethoff. They said that one of their beliefs was that uh, innovation comes from the discoveries of outsiders, scientists, and navigators. 
the, the, the discoveries of scientists and navigators uh, uh, are noticed by entrepreneurs uh, sitting around having coffee every morning. And and, and uh, they they sort of figure out uh, they sort of know in Schumpeter in Schumpeter's mind uh, these entrepre- entrepreneurs uh, have a sense of uh, what what, ap- what commercial applications can be made uh, um, f- from from those. Uh, from the uh, scientific from the, from the scientific discoveries and then the uh, and and then the financiers have a sense of, of what new applications w- would be adopted by in, in the marketplace um, Schumpeter says uh, yes it's amazing but they really do just know they just have this marvelous Acumen, this marvelous uh, sense, the financiers uh, of, of what of what w- w- would work and, and what would not, and so so that's uh, Schumpeter's thought. He says that uh, the discoveries of scientists and and, and 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 navigators don't lead to innovation by some sort of immaculate conception. They do require entrepreneurs, but that's a kind of a slender contribution. And did he get? He did. He was onto something with the creative destruction idea, though. Yes, but oh, I just want to make one thing. I forgot to say, with regard to, with with regard to whether businesses are creative, lest he be misunderstood, he makes it explicit. He says almost nothing, almost never does anything creative come out of a business. Hmm. That's surprising. Yeah, that's a 1911 book, uh, which was later translated into English and under the title Theory of Economic Development. But his later work, um, he was a little more um, on the market. Yeah, yeah. In his later work, um, he saw that you don't that, – that, that the businesses could hire scientists. He was enthralled by the DuPont laboratories. So he saw that businesses could hire scientists in order to do research in house so so <clears throat> but he 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 never had any concept that business people uh from from their observations of of how things are being produced and what sort of what sorts of products are being produced uh could could uh come up with uh better ways of producing and, and better products to produce. He, 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 that was just outside his um, imagination. Well, let's move closer to the present. In in the nineteen, there, there's a widespread belief among economists, and you echo it in your book, that starting around 1970, the <clears throat> productivity and innovation <throat> in the U.S. economy slowed down. Yeah, and. Um, I, I'm a skeptic about that. I think of that claim. It's a common claim, but I'm a skeptic. One of the reasons I'm skeptical is I look – I was alive in 1970. You were too. Uh, yeah, yeah. And, and <clears throat> it's – again, it's not very econometrically uh, sophisticated or satisfying. But when I look around and see the access of everyday people to the extraordinary set of things that we have now compared to what they were in 1970, I wonder if – some of our measurement problems are, are what are the cause of that slowdown, not not the reality. Do you want to well, react Ross, to that? As, as you know, you're a trained economist. You know that if something grows at 1% per annum, which is kind of a crawl, right? Yep. Then thanks to compound interest. Rule of 72. It, it doubles. Rule of 72. It doubles in 72 years. Yep. So – there you go. I mean, well, now it, we, have, we haven't had 70 years since 1973. We've had only, what? Uh, 40. We're a little more than halfway to seven, halfway to uh, the 72-year mark. So we're, 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 we're almost halfway through the process of doubling 
which will be completed after 70 years. Um, so we're, we're seeing, we're, we're seeing, we're seeing that there's no doubt about it, that, uh, productivity has increased, but it's, but it was going twice as fast between 1922 and 70 and 1972. So what changed? So what changed? Why do you attribute that slowdown? I, 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 I <clears throat> well, first of all, I, I want to emphasize again, I'm not saying that there was a slowdown in each and every country, in each and every company or each and every industry. I'm, I'm suggesting instead that there was a narrowing of, uh, innovation, uh, to, to fewer industries. And, um, And uh, now, you know, now, so this, so this, so the, uh, there's this huge challenge then that that gets sort of thrown up uh, at, at the end of the book is how to explain this. Um, <clears throat> it 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 was uh, one thing to explain the birth of the modern economies, but and. Uh, but now, now it's, it's it's an even harder problem, I think, because we haven't had enough time to think about it. Uh, even harder problem to explain the this uh, decline of innovation. So, so my my first instinct was, just, well, I have to back up a little bit. I argued that it was the birth of modern values that provided the fuel uh, for. In- for for the modern economies for the for the modern economies in in uh, Britain and America and, and, and later uh maybe less fuel but nevertheless it was there uh in uh in Germany and, and, and France so the the first hypothesis that occurred to me is aha uh-huh, so maybe we've lost our modern values or lost uh that maybe they're not as strong as they were before well <clears throat> Unfortunately, the University of Michigan World Values Surveys don't go back more than, I think, the earliest wave of, of data they gathered was uh, around uh, 1980. So so we can't get back to the 60s and 50s and 40s. Uh, so I, so uh, I gave up on that hypothesis. But, but what I... Could still be true. <laughs> could still be true. Yeah, absolutely. Could still be true. But um, what I do think I see is a uh, rise of uh, traditional – rise of some traditional values that are um, – and, and the rise of some anti-modern uh, values that that uh, I, I think uh, – have have caused uh, real trouble. Um, <clears throat> what are they? Uh, and well, um, under traditional values, I think people used to love their work. A lot of people just love their work. Going back to the 1930s, and I was alive then. Uh, <laughs> and, and, um, and, and, uh, I read books as a kid that suggested that people love their lives. They love the excitement, love the novelty, love the adventure. So it seems to me though, that, that, that love of, of, um, uh, the stimulus of change and the challenge of problem solving and uh, overcoming obstacles and all that seems to me that that sort of got pushed in the pushed into the shadow by a rise of materialism. People are just going for the money. I don't know why, but but it seems that that that. The money is, is, is now an, an obsession almost with, with money it is um, driving behavior to, to an extent that um, 
it wasn't in the, the that wasn't found in the 19th century or in the 20th century certainly right up to um right up to 1940 or even a bit later let me let me suggest a what i think is a simpler hypothesis i think i do think people are, are materially focused but i don't know if that's changed at all um it seems to me that as we get wealthier we value security we value uh, comfort we aren't as willing to risk what we have and, and and possibly lose it so and having said that at the same time there i don't think there's a better time to be alive and be 22 years old and educated um and more <clears throat> people are educated than ever before so i would look to things that as you do in the book that st that stifle innovation uh, rather than suggesting that we've somehow lost our innovative drive. Now, I do take your point, which you make in the book, that there are certain cultural advantages America has had in terms of willing to take willingness to take risks, willingness to fail. And I still think we have those, but I, I do think that there are policy and other cultural currents that are that are working against it. Uh, work against what? Against the ability and willingness of people to take chances in innovation. I mean, uh, that right now, if you, if you want to start a company, yes, there's red tape in America. Yes, there's way too much bureaucracy. Yes, taxes are hard if you want to grow past a certain size. All those things I think are, are stifling. Uh, yeah. But uh, but the ability using, using the internet, using uh, 3D manufacturing, referring to a, an episode we did with Chris Anderson on that innovation, the things that are coming along – that let people express themselves, I think are still quite extraordinary. It's just not being reflected right now in the economy because we're in a terrible malaise in the aftermath of the 2008 crisis. But I think things are much, I'm much more optimistic. Well, um, I, I'm not done yet because I also think I, I see um, <clears throat> um, a rise of some, um, I mean, materialism we've always had with us. In ancient times, after all, they were highly materialist. And, um, but I think there's also been a rise of some anti-modern values, such as conformism, uh, sticking with the group, don't going there if you're in a, if your friends are not going there, don't go there if if uh, your family needs you at home. Um, conformism and 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 a, a, um, a culture of entitlement. Uh, rather than a feeling that you you you, you got to earn it yourself, and and then this idea of sort of moving in lockstep, the, the politicians love to peddle that that what what we that in America we are we are all this together we're in, in all this we're in this together, uh, we're in the same boat, and we're going to move forward together, and if, if somebody makes a bundle, well. Uh, stakeholders will come in and, 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 and give him suggestions for for um, how he should uh, share the uh, share his good fortune. Um, so I, I think I think there's a, a whole mess of uh, of um, anti-modern values now that are out there that um, give rise to social protection policies. Uh, also, um, companies now are, you know, lobbying for carve outs, lobbying for special regulations that will benefit them and nobody else. Um, so it's now, it's now very, it's now very much harder, um, uh, for, um, well, let, 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 let me make a, a, another point. Well, let me, lead, let me lead up to this in a different way. Uh, there's all that lobbying out there, and what's that about? Well, that's that's rent seeking. Rent seeking is 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 not new. I mean, Jean Baptiste Say talked about it in his uh, 1800 textbook, approximately 1800, I think. Um, but but now it's it it's massive, and and, and uh, the government seems to. Um, the, the government 
seems to be uh, all too prepared to listen to every demand of every company for uh, special treatment and the laws. You know, there's been a tremendous swelling of, of uh, regulations so that um, the uh, the banking the new ba- the new banking law was something like uh, 1,200 pages of text. And that's just getting started. <laughs> that's, that's not the yeah. that's not the actual regulations. That's just the uh, framework. Yeah. So so it's good for I lawyers. Think, I, I think I think this means that the CEOs are are um, very de- see that lobbying is more uh, profitable than than innovating. Yeah. No, that's a huge problem, and it it's um and I do think it takes a cultural toll, and it's very hard to fight because you can't really can't prove and it's even hard to illustrate and make it plain to citizens what the costs of those are they see the benefits they yeah. see that things are people yeah, are being right. kept in line and <clears throat> they don't see the fact that it that the at the margin when that CEO is trying to decide whether to make a better product or take a trip to Washington sometimes mm-hmm. it's the trip to Washington that wins out and that's just devastating to across when you do that across the whole economy yeah yeah, yeah absolutely right now the second point I want to make is Suppose a company gets the rents that it was seeking. So now it's now it's more impregnable. So now it has less to fear from the innovations of upstarts that that would uh, unseat it. So now it can it, it can it can uh, it can it can do it doesn't have to do the the defensive innovation that it was doing before. So even if it even if it doesn't do any more new rent seeking, the the old rent seeking to the extent it was successful ha- has now made it less necessary for the company to do defensive innovation, and and and, and the outsiders, the upstarts who who would have who would have the the, the guys who would have been uh, startup entrepreneurs, uh, that. They're doing less of it because there are fewer um, entryways uh, into the established industry industries. So um, it just seems to me that uh, at every turn uh, we're digging ourselves ourselves into a, into a non-innovative hole. Yeah, and then there's the bailouts, the do-overs, and, and of course they don't go to everybody. They just go to the more politically powerful. We should let people bear the responsibility for their decisions, and then you get better decisions. If you bail them out, you get worse decisions. It's kind of, kind of straightforward. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. Talk, talk about the great – A lot of those things, of course, have been said before. I think that the, the, the originality of my book is that I'm, I'm tying each one of these two innovations. And arguing that innovation is is the lifeblood of an economy, not only for job satisfaction, but also for the number of jobs. Once companies stop being innovative, then they don't need as many people. And 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 once the economy is growing more slowly, uh, then then uh, wealth piles up relative to wages because wages are not growing as fast anymore. So uh, people are retiring earlier, and and fewer people, and more people are taking time out to do other things. So it's it's just um, it's 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 one thing after another. Well, you point out that you just argued that innovation uh, creates employment. A lot of people are worried about the other direction. Tyler yeah. Ka- Tyler Cowen yeah. was a guest on the program a, a few episodes back, and he he sees uh-huh. a future where innovation in artificial intelligence is going to make it very difficult for lots of people to who are currently working to have a job. Are you worried about that kind of change coming to the American economy? Well, I guess um, I guess we have to worry about it. It's not in the book. I don't know enough about that subject. Uh, I, I do know um, um, some some basic economics of uh, some basic macroeconomics of innovation, and uh, for example, 
the, the kind of innovation that uh, has all sorts of benefits for jobs uh, is innovation that uh, increases the productivity of uh, capital, which then lowers prices, which raises uh, lowers prices of consumer goods. Well, I'm not, I'm not telling this right. There's a familiar story out there. I didn't invent it. The, the Austrians did, and, and the Vixel in Sweden and so forth. The idea is that uh, uh, to a rough approximation, we can think of uh, consumer goods as being produced mainly with capital. And, and uh, capital goods is produced mainly with labor. Now, if you have, if if the innovation is is in the consumer goods sector, then uh, that's driving the price of consumer goods down relative to money wages. So real wages are rising, and that pulls up employment, and that's great. But once you start having innovation in the production of the capital goods, then you got two things going on. One, labor is physically more productive in making capital goods. But the capital goods that labor makes are now going to be cheaper in terms of consumer goods. So so that's a bummer. Uh, <laughs> and and that, that, uh, that, that lowers real wages and, and, uh, and thus leads on to uh, uh, a reduction of... Um, labor force participation and employment. Now, you raised the question toward the end of the book of what kind of an economy we'd want to live in, one that's more uh, at rest and stable versus one that's more dynamic. And you suggested for a long time we wanted to live, most people want to live in a dynamic economy. And I'm sympathetic to that view. But then again, I have a good life. Um, what's your argument in favor of the good life and what economic policy gets us there? Well, <clears throat> I didn't invent the idea of the good life. Um, Aristotle um, yeah, it's slightly older. to it uh, yeah. a few thousand years ago. Um, but Aristotle's idea is it, it's the life that, that we admire in others and, and would like to uh, imitate for ourselves, that we, we would like to aspire to our, ourselves, those of us that, that can. Well, <clears throat> not much was done with this idea until really uh, the end of the Renaissance when uh, people started talking about how human beings have creativity and human beings can think for themselves and and should think for themselves and, and uh people should be independent they should uh have their own bank accounts and make that make their own living rather than depending on others for uh some sort of share of of the um, of the booty or the harvest or whatever so um over the, over the, uh, from around 1490, right up to 1940, you have a whole string of philosophers who are basically defining the good life as a life of um, adventure and discovery and exploration and uh, and um, <clears throat> meeting problems, overcoming hurdles, and creating, creating stuff. And, and that's the, for me, that's a good life. I'm sold on that. That's, that, 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 and that's, that, I believe that, that's, would be, for most people, the good life. Most people would like to live that life, though not, not everybody, uh, not everybody can, can can attain it. Some people are, are, are don't have the talent uh, to be able to, to to do much of that. Um, 
but um, I would I would think that a, a vast majority of the population have enough talent and enough interesting interest in it that they can share that they can share uh, and, and they can take pleasure and share in uh, what a company is doing uh, in, in, in trying to uh, produce better or produce a better product or produce a new product. Um, you don't have to be an Einstein to do that. You can be caught up in that work. So, so I, I, so I, it seems to me this, this good life is terrific. And, and aren't we lucky that in this day and age, uh, uh, a sizable majority of people can, can do that. And, and, um, but un, 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 unfortunately, we seem to have lost the key at, at, at some point. We, something has gone wrong in our politics, and I think in underlying that, something has gone wrong uh, in our values. Uh, that there's um, too much um, the, the pull of tradition, the pull of family ties, the pull of friends, um, the pull of the almighty dollar. Uh, making a buck, I think a, a whole bunch in conformism, all those things I mentioned, all those have conspired to, to, to make it to make it harder to innovate. Well, the only thing I would add to that that I think is a little cheerier is that even folks who don't have um, fascinating jobs that allow for the human expression that you rhapsodize about, I think quite elo eloquently in the book, which are these things you've mentioned, challenges, facing challenges, creating, overcoming, uh, striving. Yeah. I think these are deep human urges and deeply yeah. satisfying when, when they're successful. Yeah. But even folks who struggle to find workplace activity that does that have leisure activity now that they didn't have 50 and 100 years ago. They have the time to do things and the things you can do in your time now are, are really rather remarkable. Um you can connect with people around the world via the internet. You can learn about things you didn't know about. You can be wowed and amazed through the, the visual arts in ways that were unimaginable 25 and 50 years ago. So I am a somewhat more cheerful on that perhaps than some. But <clears throat> the point I want to close with is that you're suggesting that the current state of the United States economy – is not just uh, a temporary problem related to the 2008 crisis, but rather something more systemic. Right. And I, and I want to ask you, as to close on this issue, what have you learned? What have you learned from the crisis that has forced you, if anything? And I don't know if there is anything, but if there's anything that's changed you, the way you look at economics or the economy, and uh, how do you think that's that might change uh, the profession going forward? Well, um, I, I think the, the the book has has changed the way I think, and, and the way of, in the in the course of working through it. Um, some years before I I started the book, um, uh, I, I didn't I didn't really appreciate how how important it is for for human satisfaction to be uh, engaged in doing rewarding things. And, and, um, and, 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 and now, and, and I think this has been, this was so important in America's history, this, this activism, this love of jumping in, uh, Jumping into a problem and interacting with others and dealing dealing with it, and uh, and but there's this there's this whole counterculture is is has, is rising now, is rising up, uh, which instead looks at passive pleasures like uh, going to museums, going to a sports spa stadium. Uh, taking walks in the park, uh, uh, amenities, uh, all of that, 
leisure. Leisure, 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 leisure. Um, gosh, I can't think of anything. Well, maybe I should put it put it in the form of a question. Is, isn't it pretty passive to be sitting in front of a laptop, laptop or other computer looking at the screen? Isn't that, I mean, playing computer games or, or, or um, looking at... Uh, looking at information coming in on the computer. It seems to me this is just, this is very passive. I, I would go stir crazy. I would go out of my mind uh, doing that all day. I've got, I've got to be got to be involved in something. I hope another 400-page book won't get a hold of me because <laughs> that's going a little too far. That's overdoing it. Uh, but uh, but I, I, I think that uh, people really need to, to be uh to be engaged in in uh, doing things, doing rewarding things, and, and and having the excitement of of striving, and 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 all these all this talk about the quality of life and clean cities and clean air and and and, and nice amenities like. Uh, a farmer's uh, market you can visit on a Sunday after you stroll yeah. from the park. <laughs> right. Uh, uh, that that's for me. That's not making it, and and yet that seems to be the direction in which we're going. Well, yeah. In defense of of um, the other side, I'd suggest that right now there's somebody listening to this who has who's walking in the park who's being contemplative and who's struggling to understand what we're talking about. And I don't, I don't consider that passive. Um, it's a different kind of involvement than perhaps in the past, but I think it's, I think it is the wave of the future. Uh, and I think it's always going to be a challenge to make it come to life and to make it real and to make it vivid in a way that say watching a sitcom maybe isn't, but there's still lots of things we do that aren't as dramatic as say. um, sculpture uh that that I think are very very real but I was asking you more about about the crisis do you think do you feel that the financial crisis and the current state of the economy has challenged any of your views on macroeconomics or on policy that you, that you think have that you've had to 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 deal with or change well i i think that it has uh, I, I think the crisis did uh, underline the um, short-termism of uh, the financial sector, uh, the, the willingness to take uh, big risks, the leverage like mad uh, for the sake of uh, huge returns, uh, n- never mind the uh, never mind the risk. After all, it's not their money. Um, so I, I think. Um, so I think that the the, the financial crisis was uh, a demonstration uh, of that. Um, well, whether I uh, learned any uh, other lessons from it that that bear on, on um, innovation, I, I I I think I think that the, that the uh, that the causes of the financial crisis have something to do with the slowdown of, of uh, productivity growth uh, brought about by the slowdown of innovation. I think uh, one administration after another was uh, <clears throat> uh, throwing ammunition at, at, at the economy, trying to, trying to boost employment, trying to, Trying to bring back the low unemployment rates and 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 the high growth rates uh, pre 1973, and uh, they were they were doing reckless things to to try to do that. Huge budgetary deficits under Reagan, um, huge tax cuts um, uh, by. Uh, George W. Bush in, in uh, 2001 and 2003, and then uh, pumping up 
Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac and pressuring the banks to uh, to uh, lower loan standards. That was a bipartisan all the, all effort. The, all this was to replace the prosperity uh, that we lost uh, when the innovation slowed down. So, so yeah, um, it, in a way, that I, in a way, I think that the, uh, the the that the financial and the fiscal crises both are demonstrations and, and reminders uh, of the uh, poor condition into which the American economy has fallen uh, in the past 40 years. My guest today has been Edmund Phelps. His book is Mass Flourishing. Ned, thanks for being part of Econ Talk. Thanks, Russ. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.